Welcome to the Australian Hiker Podcast, Australia's longest running hiking podcast downloaded over 1 million times worldwide and providing you with an Australian perspective on all things hiking. We're your hosts, Tim and Jill Savage, coming to you from Darawal country. This is episode 281 of the Australian Hiker Podcast. And in this week's episode, we bring you an on-trail episode from the Climber Coast Walk. We hope you enjoy. Before we get into today's episode, if you'd like to help support Australian Hiker and this podcast, there are a couple of ways that you can help us out. Firstly, by subscribing on your podcast host of choice so that each episode is available as soon as it's published. And if you have the opportunity, leave us a five-star review. Another way to support us is go to the Australian Hiker website at www.australianhiker.com.au and click on the supporters page and buy us a coffee. You can do a one-off donation or become a monthly supporter. All donations are greatly appreciated and help us to continue producing this podcast and blog. Now let's get on to today's episode. Recently we had the opportunity to walk the Kiama Coast Walk centred around Kiama and southern New South Wales. This was a walk that we hadn't really been aware of until the last year when we saw it on a a TV show titled Great Walks and we decided to see what it would be like. The following series of recordings uh, is brought to you from our one day walk of this 21 kilometre track including a pre-walk recording when we went to check out the inlet the night before. It's 7.11 on Thursday night. We've just come down to Wherry Lagoon, where the Kaima Coast Walk finishes, just to have a look at the uh, lagoon crossing, because this was a potential sticking point. Had the lagoon been at its highest point, and it looks like it can sort of get up reasonably uh, good height, we wouldn't have been able to cross, and we would have had to have walked back towards Kaima uh, to the next place we could actually get off trail. So we just wanted to double check and see what it was like. We're a couple of hours past low tide at the moment. And I think we could probably cross where we, in a couple of places, that's probably 30 centimetres, maybe 40 centimetres at the deepest. So it's actually quite reasonable. Yeah, so it does look quite good and, um, you know, pretty calm. So that's uh, another good thing to watch out for. Looking back up the coast, though, you do get a a few glimpses of what we'll be walking through tomorrow and it just looks quite stunning. So very much looking forward to the start of this walk and obviously coming into the end where we are at the moment. Okay, we will talk to you tomorrow uh, as we start this walk. It's Friday, 26th of January, Australia Day, and we're here in Kiama to do the Kiama Coast Walk. We've just been dropped off at the Minamura train station and there's actually we're thinking oh where where is the start and we sort of moved about two meters and saw a trailhead sign the start of the walk is actually probably a couple of hundred meters away uh, but this is probably the easiest place as far as a, a location is concerned to be dropped off forecast for today they actually had heat wave warnings but i think the maximum temperature was 33 and that was supposed to be 11 o'clock this morning But at the moment, it's overcast. It is warm and muggy, but it looks like a reasonably pleasant day. I don't know if it's going to stay like this or whether we're going to be uh, getting a bit clearing up and getting a bit hot. Yeah, I think uh, it's good that the cloud's over. I think it would be quite uh, hot um, even this time of the morning uh, without that cloud cover. But, yeah, I think it's a little bit humid, but we'll be fine. I think uh, we've worked out which direction we need to head, so it's onwards now. Okay, time-wise, it's just on 7 o'clock, so we'll head off. It's 8.25. We've been going for almost an hour and a half now. We just had a convenient spot to stop in a grassy area with a couple of covered picnic tables. We are just at the beach leading into Kaima, and by the look of the map, it, I think it looks like it says it's Bombo. Uh, we've been four kilometres and we've got four kilometres to go to the blowhole, so we're roughly halfway mark on the first of three sections. So this section, by the look of it, is the longest section. It's around about eight kilometres. The other two sections are roughly six-ish kilometres, which takes us up to around about 20, 21 kilometres in total. 
One thing that's interesting with this walk is we're following the trail, but there's certainly lots of off choices you could make. You could choose to go down to some of the little bays. You could choose to go down to the beach and have a swim. So you could take as long as you want on this walk. I think realistically from our perspective, we'd probably take around about six and a half hours. So we expect to finish sometime between 1.30 and 2.30, uh, depending on how fast we move and where we stop for lunch. And yeah, you could probably take another couple of hours longer if you decided to have a swim or just decided to have a relax. Yeah, so it's been quite pleasant so far. I mean, a bit of overcast, a bit of cloud cover. Which Which is a good thing. Yeah, it is a good thing. Um, It's very humid, um, so we're both dripping, having done an hour and a half. Feels a little bit longer than that. Um, But very pleasant, and we've, you know, done headlands and some open grasslands and walk past some interesting houses, interesting in a good way. Um, if so, if you like architecture, then um, this is an interesting walk to do as well. So, yeah, lot, lots to keep you focused and looking around and, um, uh, yeah, not worrying too much about the heat. <laughs> okay, we'll just have a minute or two rest here and then we'll head off. It's 10 to 10, so we've been going two hours and 50 minutes, and we've just come in through Kaima itself and gone up to the lighthouse and the blowhole, which is probably one of the main features on this uh, this walk. A bit sad at the moment, I must admit. I realised I probably haven't been here for about 30 years, and you know, it, the blowhole's pretty much hit and miss. You, know, you, need, you do need some wind and some sea conditions to push the water up through the blowhole. So today the sea was reasonably calm. Uh, blowhole was hardly moving at all. So I've got a couple of very weak, limp blows through the blowhole, but uh, that's about it. Yeah, yeah, I stood there for a little while trying to get a good video, but uh, um, the, the best one uh, isn't, from my memory, memory the best I've seen uh, the blowhole. But uh, lots of people about um, enjoying uh, Australia Day out in the weather, um, still overcast, which uh, we're very pleased at about, but uh, still very humid. Okay, we're just sitting here uh, on one of the picnic chairs. It's actually the Kaima show this weekend, so we're just about to walk past the showground area. Uh, but we're just stopping at a little bay just uh, at, at the start of the road up to uh, the blowhole itself. You might be able to hear the ocean in the background. But again, it's reasonably calm and flat today. It's quarter to 11 and we've done just on 11 kilometres in 3 hours and 45 minutes on the Kayama Coast Walk. And we're just sitting here... Just on the outskirts of Kaima, really, we've, we've sort of still got some uh, housing estates to go, Kaima Heights and th- things like that. But I think the bulk of the urban is behind us with a, a, a tiny bit more ahead. Temperature-wise, it's 26.5 degrees and it's 72% humidity. Uh, and I must admit, I'm not a fan of humidity. It really knocks me around. It sucks all the energy out of me. And this walk's no different. Uh, give me 11 degrees and uh, no humidity any time. Oh, look, it's not that bad. I mean, it, you do feel it and, you know, we're sweating quite a bit, but Tim will survive, I'm sure. Um, the coastline is just lovely. Um, and as Tim said, I, I think probably from here on we'll see less and less people. You can hear a beach in the background and you can um, hear kids playing and so on. I think possibly we'll hear less and less of that as we go on. Maybe not, but... Uh, time will tell. So where we are at the moment is Kalaula Head. I'm not quite sure how you pronounce that one. And we're just sitting on the top of it, just on one of the chairs, just overlooking the uh, the bays back to us. There's two swimming beaches. There's Kendall's Beach Reserve uh, and then Chapman Point Reserve uh, just further over. So we're just sort of going through and looking at the beaches. Lots of people out spending time on the beach today for Australia Day. Um... I must admit, I, even though I knew it was Australia Day, but you just tend to forget uh, because it's, it's a Friday, which is really strange. It's 12.15. We've been going for around about 4 hours and 45 minutes, and we've covered uh, just under 14 kilometres, and we've got 7 kilometres approximately left to go. So we're about a, a kilometre out of Loves Bay, 
and then down to uh, Warrior Beach. From here, we start picking up a lot more of the grassy areas. There still is um, uh, houses, but you can, they are starting to get a bit sparser as we, we get away from the towns themselves. Temperature is feels like it's getting up. And in fact, at the moment, when we're sitting here, it was 26.5, so it hasn't really changed. Feels like 27. Feels like 27. <laughs> Humidity's actually dropped. It's down to 64%, but it, you know, I'm just sweating at the moment. Water's just pouring off me. Yeah, so we're sitting at this uh, headland. Uh, there's a few picnic tables, a couple of seats as well, um, a barbecue, which is kind of nice, um, and a water bubbler. So I've just doused my hat with water to cool myself down. Um, when we walk on a little bit uh, further, just, I don't know, probably 40 metres or so, we'll see some signage and some parking um, for the picnic area. Yeah, so at the moment we're seeing at Kaima Coast Walk, picnic area and lookout. Um, as Jill said, there's a barbecue area, picnic table, and we're right, uh, behind, right behind us is a brand new house that's being, being built. built. There's some <laughs> amazing houses with some amazing views. Um, def- definitely is uh, worth the look, worth the walk if you're interested in architecture. Okay, we'll have a bit more of a sit down and a rest here, and we'll head off. It's just on three o'clock. Uh, we've finally finished the Kaima Coast Walk. Yay! <laughs> after just on eight hours as well. The final leg was enthusiastic and also very exhausting. <laughs> um, but yeah, it's a, it was a great finish. Um, we're just sitting here in the park. Uh, lots of people are um, actually arriving uh, still. Uh, to spend some time on the beach. Um, I guess it's starting to cool down a little bit. Um, So, yeah, we're watching the crowd and we're having a bit of a breather and um, working out what's next. And what's next for us is working out how we actually get back to Kaima. We'll (laughs) we'll talk about that when we go through and review the walk. Okay, that's all for today. Okay, so those recordings that you heard were, as we said, taken the night before we started the walk and on the day of the walk, just to give you an indication of what we thought of the walk and how we were feeling along the way. We'll start off talking about the pre-recording, pre-walk recording. Uh, And for us, this was a bit of a confusing sort of walk in that we knew there was an inlet crossing at Wherry Inlet at Jerangong. We weren't too sure what the condition of the inlet is like. Now, I've crossed a number of inlets uh, all up and down the New South Wales south coast as well as interstate, and really the condition of them will, will depend on what the sea conditions are like and whether the inlets are open and closed. So in the case of Wherry Inlet... This is an inlet that is closed sometimes, which means you can walk on sand to get from one side to the other. Or in the case that we had, the inlet was open. Uh, And really having no idea what it was like, we thought we'd drive down the night before uh, and just have a, a look, just after a short drive to see what was there. And the tricky thing about this one was that Uh, the direction that we were heading, this inlet was going to be right at the end, and I mean right, right, right at the end of the walk. Uh, And if we'd gotten there from the the north side of the inlet and discovered we couldn't cross, we were going to have to go back another four and a half kilometres. So the tricky thing about this and why we decided that we needed to check that we could cross the inlet was that the direction that we were undertaking this walk, we were going from north to south, and if we'd gotten to the north side of the inlet and discovered uh, that we couldn't cross, uh, it meant that we would have to go back the way we came, and essentially we would have just completed a leg of six kilometres, and we would have to have walked back that six kilometres right, right, right at the end of the walk. And the reasoning for that was that uh, we had a strip of land between the ocean and private property, and it meant we would have had to have crossed over private property, uh, which 
<laughs> we we definitely would not recommend. <laughs> no, no. So um, yeah, it, it was it was worthwhile for the sake of a short, relatively short drive. Go down and have a look. Make sure everything was okay. In which case, we we realised it was. Uh, and then uh, start our walk the next day without having any any concern about getting to the inlet and finding it was closed. And having had a look and, you know, felt reasonably comfortable about how we could cross it, we did also discover that there was signage along the way that said it was closed. So, you know, that was another reason why it was important for us to go and have a look for ourselves. So in the case of this walk, you can either start in the north at Minamurra uh, at the train station or at the south at Wherry Inlet, uh, which is at Jerengong, uh, and make your way north. So really the choice is yours, whichever way you want to go. But there is a map and an information sheet you can download from the Kaima uh, tourism uh, uh, website, and it, it is basically written as if you're walking from north to south. Uh, the map actually breaks the track up into three sections, and I think it was roughly eight, eight and a half kilometres, uh, six kilometres and six kilometres, taking you to roughly 20 kilometres, uh, but all designed as if it were, you were heading from the north. Now, we actually decided that we were going to go through and do that. We were going to finish in the south and start at the north. Uh, and in our case, we only had one car, and we decided that we were going to leave the car at our hotel and get an Uber to the trailhead, which is what we did. This walk is designed to start at the Minamara train station in the north uh, and then travel south, uh, and you can potentially get a train back to Sydney at the end of the day. So if you really don't feel like staying there and you, you happen to live in Sydney, it's a good opportunity to take uh, take use of the, the train system. Yeah, or Wollongong or, you know, other, other, other ports a little bit further north of um, Minamara. Yep. So we got an Uber up to Minamara. Uh, we got dropped off at the train station, and we were thinking, "Oh, where is the where's the trailer?" <laughs> yeah. There's this huge <laughs> sign. <laughs> we <Yeah>. found <laughs> when you get dropped off on the road, you don't see it. You've got to walk about five meters, and you turn around, and there it is. That's the trailhead. But really, the trail, uh, uh, the start of the walk actually is at the boat ramp, which is on the other side of the Minamara River Inlet. And we just had to walk probably about a kilometre, I would guess, uh, and start the walk from that point. Uh, again, there's no way knowing you can cross the Minamura River. That's just a bit too big uh, unless you've actually got some sort of watercraft with a, a canoe or a board of some type. And on the day that we were there, there was certainly plenty of that kind of activity happening even early in the morning. The starting point was a bit confused for us because the boat ramp area was chock-a-block full of vehicles. <laughs> uh, and, in fact, there were vehicles parking and they were actually blocking the signs to actually where the trail started. Uh, so you can either start at the uh, car park level or you're dropping down onto the, the rocky sort of sandy beach below, which is what we did, and then came back up around about 70 or 80 metres uh, later on. And I think that's probably um, an important point to make that, you know, there are different routes that you can take on this. As long as you're heading in the, the general direction, you can do um, as much sand walking, beach walking as you like. Um, you can skirt around the beaches um, on the paths or the, the grassland. So, you know, once you're you're in those urban areas, you'll find that there are lots of different routes that you can follow. Um, gets a little bit trickier further south, um, but certainly in those first two, probably sections, I think, um, you, you can make those choices. So starting from the north, the signs we were following were to the blowhole. And this is the Kiama blowhole, which is reasonably famous in New South Wales. I realised that I probably hadn't been to Kiama for probably about 30 years. Uh, it's been a long time since I'd been there. Uh, normally I tend to bypass it for varying reasons. Uh, and I had seen the bloke. Not because it's not a good place to be, but just other things have, are on your mind. Yeah. <laughs> um, and now the blowhole, we, I've seen the blowhole in the past when it's been in, in full force. Uh, and it's one of these funny sort of situations where you need to have – big seas and driving winds, which is not necessarily the ideal weather to sit on the beach to get the blowhole really working. And that's when it really can pump some water through the hole and, and blast up into the air, which is what it's well known for. 
So the first section, the eight-kilometre section, is very much what we class as a coastal urban walk. You're walking through suburbs. You do have some bushland along the way, but very much you are passing through the northern suburbs of the Minamara and Kiama area uh, and including a couple of beaches. And lots of really interesting architecture. I keep going on about that, um, and I did during the uh, the trail recordings. Um, but yeah, it's a great opportunity to look up and out and, and um, just take it all in. And for us, we'd, we'd never walked through the suburbs of Kaima before. It's always been you go to a hotel of some sort, you go to the, the, the main area where you have restaurants and bars, and that's about it. So it was good to look at a, an area of the coast we hadn't seen before. One thing we hadn't really thought about for this walk is that it is based around the train stations and the train tracks. And you, you, because we're someone who who don't really go on trains that often, it was really interesting to see the train tracks that did tend to stay very close to the ocean. They had some great views of uh, the, the the landscape, the, the beaches, the ocean, um, you know, the approaches to um, – the, the cliff edges and so on. Yeah, so it was really interesting for us and and I think that's probably a little bit of a, a clue that if you stay between the ocean and the railway track, then you're pretty much, you know, heading in the right direction. <laughs> yeah. Um, the walk itself probably, and this is a, a general thing overall, is it's an undulating walk. I think the highest point was probably 29 metres. Uh, the lowest point, I think, was really, we did get wet feet, so I'll say one to two metres there. We weren't walking in the ocean, but uh, when the when the water came up, I did get I'm wet feet. I'm not sure about that 29 metres. Some of those hills were pretty steep, Tim. <laughs> Well, this is working off Google Google Earth or saying I oh, know in fact I think it was thirty two meters. There you go. It is it is actually higher. Yeah, well it did feel much higher than that. But you are walking doing an undulating walk. There are beach walks and the, the sand is relatively soft. Um, you know, we uh, the Bombo Beach, which is the, the main beach coming into Kiama, um, I managed to get wet feet there and there was no it was either wet or there was soft sand. There was nothing in between because of the way that the beach was structured. Lots of people along the beaches taking advantage of the long weekend and the good weather. And I always think it's, you know, I feel very self-conscious as we're walking along completely covered up with hats and backpacks and the whole thing. And, uh, you know, there are people in their swimmers (laughs) looking at us thinking, what on earth are they doing? (laughs) Now, speaking of hats, you, know, you will notice if you have looked at the, the write-up of this podcast, you'll see me in a bluey, greenish sort of hat. I geared myself so well with everything I needed for the weekend and promptly forgot my hat because we'd had visitors over. I'd put my hat in a different area. Uh, he put his hat away. I put, put my hat away, <laughs> yeah, instead of sitting at the bottom of the stairs uh, and then promptly forgot about it. Uh, and being someone that doesn't have hair, I really had no choice but to buy a hat and the only place I could find one was from a service station, uh, <laughs> the world's most expensive and in all honesty, a, a nylon hat isn't particularly very good on hot days. Well, the only thing missing on that hat was the propeller, Tim. Yeah. <laughs> so we came into Kiama. Now, we were on a public holiday. It was the Australia Day Friday and a lot of the places were closed, which was fine. There was a few takeaways and a few cafes open uh, but you could see there were very very few and far between because when they were open there were a lot of people having breakfast or having coffees. We went up through to the blowhole uh, and have a look at that and it was a bit sad in some respects. It wasn't blowing. <laughs> no and, and that's because the weather was so nice there was very little wind even though there was uh, a marine wind warning in place. Uh, well there was little wind then. Little wind then yes. Uh, and the uh, the seas weren't really that strong. So I think Jill, probably the best image she got out of that was water coming through the blowhole, probably about a metre and a half. So. <laughs> yeah, that's right. I, I waited for a little while on with the video going and it just wasn't going to happen. So from there, we then headed into Kaima itself. Now, what we should have done was continued along the coastal uh, footpath uh, but the Kaima show was on that day and we couldn't actually get through. So we had to go back into town and up one of the main roads and cut, cut around the showground, which was probably a detour, I'd say probably 500 metres maybe at best. 
Uh, it wasn't too onerous, but again, it would have been nice to continue along the ocean uh, uh, a headland itself. When we came back to the trail again, we were pretty much onto the first of a, a series of beaches, and there were four beaches in that that next section, so we're now on section two of the trail. Again, as I said, there were so many people taking advantage of the beaches, and we were walking on beach, coming back up over a headland, next beach, and that continued on for pretty much most of section two. Now, section two was around about six kilometres, and that was from Kiama to Loves Bay, and at this stage, we're starting to get out of the Kiama Township itself and go into uh, the... uh, I'd say upmarket housing area of Kiama. Yeah, um, it was it was called Kiama Heights. So yeah. <laughs> I think somebody decided that was upmarket. So some very large, very expensive houses. Not that the other areas were down market. Let me tell you. No, no. <laughs> now before we got to Love's Bay, uh, we also came across the little blowhole, uh, <laughs> which now- was blowing more than the. Normal blowhole. Yeah, and by this stage we picked the wind had picked up, the sea conditions were coming into the rocks in just the right angle, uh, and we, you know, it was doing a much better job of the larger blowhole on the day. And that's what the guidance says that uh, when the little blowhole is blowing, um, the bigger blowhole isn't, and vice versa. From there, we made our way to Love's Bay. Now, Love's Bay. Uh, is the end of the second section and start of the third section. Uh, so that means we'd, we'd come about six kilometres from Kiama through to Loves Bay. And in this case here, the, the, the beachy area at Loves Bay, is it's more rocky. It's not really a, a sit on the beach and, and relax sort of beach. Uh, it's more just a bay that you bypass to move where you're going on to next. We did pass quite a few or walk through quite a few um, grassland areas where there were uh, picnic benches and um, seats to enjoy the view. Um, there was one just before Love's Bay that had some, you know, great amenities, including a barbecue and a car park nearby. So, you know, a, a, again, these are all places that people can drive into. I think what surprised me is that there were very few people um, on those grassy headlands. They were all down on the beach. Mind you, having said that, there were quite a few people walking the trail, particularly on the southern area of the trail. Not so much from the uh, the people walking in the northern st- section of the trail, uh, which is section one, seemed to be more walking section one, and that was it. Uh, a lot of people that we saw on the trail looked like they were either doing the southern section three from Loves Bay to Gerringong, or else they were doing Kaima to Gerringong. They didn't seem to be doing the whole trail itself. Now, in the lead up to Love's Bay, Jill came across a snake, uh, which is usually the way because typically Jill will be walking in front of me. She sees it and I don't. Uh, all she could say that it was black and flat, and that was about it. And it moved fast. Yeah. So, not quite sure what it was, but uh, uh, it was a decent size. I must admit, you, you, we didn't see any other wildlife or snakes along the trail. And I think in all honesty, when you see snakes, there's a water source somewhere and sure enough, probably 50, 60 metres away, uh, there was a creek bed coming down from uh, in between the residential area down towards the ocean. So obviously snakes still need water uh, and we're guessing this is why we, we saw the one and only snake at that point. Saw lots of little lizards though. Yeah, yeah. Moving on from Loves Bay, the final section to Wherry Lagoon, there, just after you start, probably about 100, 200 metres away, you come across two, I won't say they're, I'm not saying it's the correct term, but totem poles with Aboriginal designs on them uh, and also some Aboriginal interpretation materials talking about uh, the Aboriginal group that lives in the area and how they use it or have used it over the years. Um, and that sort of framed really the, the start of this, this section of the walk. The third section was very different from the first two sections. It was very much open, rolling, grassy hills. And very windy. (laughs) And very windy, Very windy. It got to the stage that we both had to take our hats off. My hat was, as I said, not designed as a hiking hat. It had no uh, string or cord to hold it in place. And even though Jill's did, the wind was that strong. It just flapped all over the place. So, you know, note to self, need to take a cap. (laughs) Yeah. Guessing that this was all old farmland by the look of it, 
and it was pretty much rolling grass from the top of the hills pretty much down to the cliffs. So you'll see in the images of the write-up that it, it just is rolling hills, and that's pretty much about what you're seeing on this section I did, of trail. and, uh, you know, we were talking about this on uh, the trail. I did expect more remnant vegetation. Um, I, I, I guess that was a bit of a disappointment uh, for me, but, you know, as Tim says, it was very much rolling grassy hills um, and, uh, yeah, not a lot of other type of vegetation, a little bit, but not much. One other thing I'd comment on the uh, this trail as well is the signage tends to vary. Uh, it's normally pretty good. Normally you don't have any concern about where you're going. There's enough signage to say you're heading in the right direction. Well, you just need to stay, you know, between the ocean and the railway track. Yeah. <laughs> um, but there's, there's different signage along the trail. So on the northern trailhead, there's signs which have – Kaima South Coast Track or Kaima Coast Track, uh, and then uh, in when it, when we first started off, it had blowhole. Yep. Um, then we had Kaima Coast Track, uh, Kaima Heights, uh, and then we got onto the third section. The signage changed; it became a blue and grey, blue and white and grey sign, um, saying uh, Wherry Inlet X number of kilometres. And I must admit, these signs did annoy me <laughs> because there was one every 500 metres without fail. So you were counting down the last six kilometres in 500 metre increments. Now, I prefer not to have that because, I, you know, I'd rather not have a sign for a kilometre and a half and then say, oh, we've, we've done this distance rather than we've only walked 500 metres. Yes, and the other kind of annoying bit was it was 4.9 kilometres and then point four kilometres <laughs> and then 3.9 kilometres. <laughs> so so the numbers weren't even even, Tim. <laughs> so we finally hit Wherry Inlet uh, just before three o'clock in the afternoon and crossed over. Now, it wasn't low tide. Low tide was probably another further hour on, but I think the deepest the water was going to be when you crossed, unless you deliberately went looking for something deeper, was probably about 40 centimetres. Um, if you have a look at the video in the write-up of this uh, walk, you'll see me zigzagging across the inlet, and that was only because I was walking across the light yellow patches, uh, which meant that the deepest I got to was probably 15, 20 centimetres deep. Uh, but otherwise, if you didn't worry about getting water up to maybe just below your knees, you could walk in a straight line. Yeah, and there was a video of me uh, walking across, but there were two kind of issues with it. One was... There was a couple coming the other direction and uh, they got to me face on, uh, which was okay, except they'd stirred up the water and I couldn't tell which was the deep water and which was the shallow water after that. Um, and then the other problem was that when we had a look at the video, there were whole pieces of the video where Tim hadn't bothered to follow me, so he was looking at something else, <laughs> which was kind of funny. Anyway... So you don't get to see that one. <laughs> okay, so really, I suppose, officially the walk tends to finish at Wherry Inlet and uh, Wherry Inlet has a barbecue and picnic areas, a small park. Again, very busy. Uh, small car park, uh, toilet facilities. Uh, so, And again, there was good toilet facilities along the track. So uh, you, you, know, you don't really need to worry about bringing a trowel and toilet paper unless, unless you really feel like you need to. I'm not quite sure where you would have done that out of – um, sight of anybody, but no, anyway. <laughs> no, but there, so there were plenty of toilet facilities along the way. Not so much in the way of shop facilities. Um, really, for us, we could have had uh, lunch in Kiama. We could have had lunch um, uh, as we walked out of Kiama, but then there's a gap in the afternoon where there's nothing there. So depending on the time of the day you start, you'll need to work on having food for whatever meals and snacks that you want. We got to... Uh, Wherry Inlet, the park there, we sat, we used the toilet facilities, uh, we uh, got all the sand out of our shoes uh, and we did a final recording uh, and then we thought we'll try and get an Uber back. Not going to happen. Uh, <laughs> well, particularly on a public holiday. <laughs> a public holiday in the afternoon, all the Uber drivers in the area were having the day off basically. Uh, so we thought, okay, then we'll try a taxi. No taxis. Uh, and we thought, okay, third and final option, uh, was the train. Now, we had, by the time we, we worked this out, we had 
uh, 50 minutes to go two kilometres to the train station. And we were pretty sore at that stage. We'd sat down, taken a rest, started to stiffen up, and then we thought, oh, another... T- I'm thinking it was a bit more than two kilometres, but anyway... So when when you see the distance of this, we talk. We are, it was actually nineteen point three kilometres to just over Wherry Inlet, but we're calling it twenty one kilometres to take into account that we needed to walk to the train station. So I think you know, on a normal day that wasn't a public holiday, I think the trains were coming almost every hour. So we got in at uh, three o'clock. There was a train at uh, 10 to 5. We got there about 10 to 15 minutes beforehand. Uh, we had to work out how to pay for the train. We're not New South Wales <laughs> locals. Uh, Which was pretty easy um, now that I look back. But, yes, I, I did it and then had to ask someone if that was the right thing to do. And, uh, and then I went looking for a, a map of, you know, what was the next stop and uh, this fellow walking through the the car park of the train station with his dog, I must have looked lost and said, you know, are you looking for something? And I just said a a map. And he gave me all the information that anybody ever wanted to know. So very friendly and very helpful. So this is probably the biggest consideration for this walk. We've done this walk as being a long day walk. Potentially you could do this as an overnight walk. Uh, There are caravan parks along the way, so providing you've worked out where you need to stay and you've booked rather than trying to uh, randomly expect to turn up and find their space, I don't think you'll have an issue at all. So you could do this as a two-day walk. The The trains do make it quite easy. Uh, so potentially we could have got a train from Kiama up to Minamara or Jerangong, started the walk and then finished at the other end and got a train back again, uh, providing we had a, a train timetable and we'd, we worked the timing out. For us, we took just on eight hours to do this walk. We were taking plenty of breaks along the way and doing recordings, so that tended to slow us down. Uh, but I think certainly you could certainly do this walk faster. You could certainly do it slower. But if you are relying on the train system, you may want to actually pay attention and work out when the last trains are. Or on a normal day, you'd probably have no issue with, with getting an Uber. Yeah, and we got off the train at Kayama um, from Jeringong and uh, had a very short, relatively short walk. But again, we sat and (laughs) stiffened up a bit. Uh, Short walk back to the hotel, which was kind of nice and pleasant. So, you know, it, it, it was, once you worked all of that out, it was relatively easy. Now, from my perspective, would I do this walk again? And I'd probably say, in all honesty, I probably wouldn't make a habit of going down there once a year to do this walk. It's a good walk. I'm glad we did it, and it's well worth doing once. And I think if you're a local, this is probably going to be one of your main walks in the area that you'll use. But I think there are probably other walks uh, and other multi-day walks uh, that are just as good and different enough, and there's too many walks to do without having to repeat them again. So I think good walk, well worth doing, but I think it's probably a a once-off sort of thing and then move on to the next walk that you've got on your list. Yeah, I'd agree with that. Um, I did enjoy it. Um, you know, I would have liked a little bit more remnant vegetation, but I guess, you know, it's a pretty populated area and, um, you know, was uh, um, and was farming land uh, for a long time and in many parts still is. So, Yeah, you know, it was very pleasant, love the ocean views, and it is all about the vistas. Um, Whether you would walk north to south or south to north, I think that really depends on you and the logistics that you're you're planning. Um, You know, looking looking south, the views were great. Uh, Looking north, they were just as good. So, you know, I'm not sure that there's much of a difference um, in the direction for what you might experience. A couple of other comments I'd make on this walk is that there's an opportunity, as you'll mention, to do a bit of a choose your own adventure. So if you, yeah. you know, we we are not into doing a hike where we stop and sit on the beach for an hour and go for a swim. It's just <laughs> it's just not what we tend to do. Uh, but certainly, you could you know if you want to make this a you know a, a ten or eleven hour day and you know stop to go for a beach swim and have a lunch in Kiama and do all that sort of stuff. That's a good opportunity, and this is a great walk for that. The other thing is I call this walk a an urban coastal walk. 
I'd also call it a heritage walk as well because because the interpretation signage along the trail is excellent. Yes, it is. Uh, I learned so much about the Kiama area and the coastal geology and the history of the area that I didn't know before. Um, you know, so as an example, on the southern section of the trail, there were they were saying for about 170 years there was no public access down to the cliff, which means that walk wasn't possible. So now that they've got a, a public access way along the cliff line, this walk is able to be done now. Uh, but it provides, this signage provides information on Aboriginal heritage, on European heritage and on geological uh, history as well and how the area was developed. So uh, that I think was probably the, one of the favourite things for me uh, as far as this walk was concerned. Yeah, and it was really interesting because, you know, we stopped and read and um, took a photo of, you know, all those um, interpretation si- signs, but we seemed to be in the minority. And I'm not sure whether that's because people were familiar with it, but, you know, there was at least one group who, uh, from their accents, uh, clearly were tourists and visitors, not uh, not locals, and, and their conversation was very much about that. So, yeah, um, it is it is something that you need to kind of take in along the way to really absorb and appreciate. So, you know, um, that would take take a bit more time as well. So if you want more information on this walk, go to the write-up. The link will be in the show notes for that. And we've also got an on-trail video uh, photographic uh, 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 slideshow that will take you through from the start to finish to the walk just to give you a better indication of what it was like. Okay, we hope you've enjoyed this episode. That's all for me. Bye for now. And bye from me.